All right, welcome back. We have just seen some clips from Muhammad Ali. This is the four part new documentary film from the great Ken Burns. The full film, by the way, is available to stream online at pbs.org slash Ali. And it's also available via the PBS video app. That's where you can see the whole thing. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you two special guests that will share some reflections on some of what we've seen tonight. Valerie Babb. Valerie is the Andrew Mellon Professor of the Humanities at Emory University in Atlanta. She holds a joint appointment in the Departments of African American Studies and English. Dr. Babb is the author of A History of the African American Novel and Whiteness Visible, The Meaning of Whiteness in American Literature and Culture. Valerie is a graduate of Queens College of the City University of New York. She holds a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Buffalo. And Marcus Dexter. Marcus is the Assistant Director of Student Initiatives within the Office of Institutional Diversity at the University of Georgia. He's also the Interim Director of the Georgia African American Male Experience Program at UGA. His research has centered around the experiences of academically and athletically high achieving black male athletes. His work seeks to gain a greater understanding of the ways in which black male athletes, academic, athletic, and racial identities are impacted by their lived experiences, affecting their senses of self. He is currently a sport management and policy doctoral candidate at the University of Georgia, getting ready to complete his studies in September. Welcome to both of you. Hello. I see you there. Hello. Thank you. All right. I want to start, I think, I don't even know where to start. There's so much that has that we've just experienced. Um, and maybe that's a good place to start. Certainly, there have been so many documentaries and books that have been done about Ali. So did we need this documentary? What do you, what do you think, Marcus? I think we did. I don't think we'll ever fully understand the complexity that was Muhammad Ali. Um, I think we see so many sides to himself. We learn so much more as it goes through because there's Muhammad, there's Cassius Clay, there's Cassius X, there's Muhammad Ali, there's Muhammad Ali the athlete, there's Muhammad Ali the father. You know, there's so many parts and layers to him that we don't really know and from his various children as well that helps us really get a glimpse It really is at how did society and the ways in which the, the individuals that he was impacted by and also his desires really shaped who he was and how he came to be the figure that we know today. Mm, yeah, what about you, Valerie? I actually do think we need this documentary, not so much for what it tells us about Ali, but for what it tells us about ourselves. I was just thinking of that scene where he is lighting the torch at the Olympics. And you look at moments like those and they can lull you into a sense of thinking everything is okay. We've achieved what we've achieved and we're good now. And I think it's exactly the opposite. And what watching this documentary does is reminds us that the things that Ali was fighting for, we're still fighting for. And that we have to be vigilant about protecting our liberties, our right to vote, our right to be who we are while we are in this society. And so seeing this documentary, I think gives us a moment to take stock and think about what else do we still need to do? Mm -hmm. So Cassius Clay uh, changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And in 1964, he announced he had changed his name from what he considered a slave name. And he became known as Muhammad Ali. This was a name chosen for him by the Nation of Islam. Many sports writers at the time uh, and, and people in the media refused to address him by that. And in a press conference, he once said, I'm free to be what I want. And to me, this reminds um, me of him saying something like, I am a man. And so Valerie, I wanna get your thoughts on this. Did, do you think that he was one of the first maybe to introduce black power to white America? And is maybe that perhaps one of the reasons why he was so hated by so many people? Yeah, I think he is the latest iteration of somebody introducing black power and a very strong black male presence, which I'm sure Marquez will talk about uh, a little bit later on, to a society that 
absolutely hates those two qualities in mm -hmm. a black man, absolutely. But I don't think he's the first, and you mentioned changing his name. That has such a long history in black life and culture. Booker T. Washington, even in Up From Slavery, talks about right after emancipation, the first thing that the formerly enslaved did was think about what their new names were going to be. And you do need a new handle, if I can borrow uh, Zora Neale Hurston's reference, once you are a new person. You need a name to get you to where you want to go and where you want to be. So I think he encapsulated that. And to change his name was to make that an explicit statement that I no longer care about this white gaze that is following me everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marquez, we see uh, sports figures like Colin Kaepernick uh, that you know remind me a lot of Mo Muhammad Ali. Uh, matter of fact, Cap uh, has has rocked a Muhammad Ali uh, T-shirt, and he yes. has. Um, and, and just to remind everyone, um, Colin Kaepernick, that's the former NFL player who famously started taking a knee during the national anthem to call attention uh, to racial inequality and police brutality against Black people, primarily uh, Black men. And I know that Colin said in a statement one time, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses Black people and people of color. Um, and he said to me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. Uh, so talk a little bit about uh, sports figures like that and their, their power. Definitely. Uh, you know, more recent iterations, you know, they have the, I guess you can say, the luck of technology to assist and help in their message. And a lot of times these messages can be received in real time. Um, and through various modes where in the past it may have taken some time for it to transmit and get to those who had the, the resources and the privileges to receive it. But I think we've always seen how athletes, especially black athletes um, have been these beacons of mm -hmm. being able to counter these dominant notions um, that really impact and stifle who they are. Um, I think what was interesting about Kaepernick, it, he was willing like others have in the past to give up these privileges, to give up this access and success and use this platform. But unfortunately, what we fail to forget is a lot of times it is black women athletes who have truly been at the center of getting this message out. We've seen that constantly with the WNBA, but also we've seen as women athletes in terms of the US soccer athletes who have also individuals have joined in. And so I think when we think about these platforms that sports and entertainment, because they bring in so much money, they bring in so much attention, they bring in so much glory, and at times bring in this national pride because of connection to what it means to be X or Y. Um, I, I think we need to also understand the fact that, that that patriotism that's intertwined with being successful and how it goes in and this competitiveness across is also something that really makes individuals uncomfortable. And at times, especially in the 60s, it made white people uncomfortable to see these athletes not fall in line, so to say. Mm -hmm. May I just add before we go on, an athlete wrote in his autobiography that he could no longer stand for the flag or sing the anthem until America lives up to its ideals. And that athlete was Jackie Robinson. But mm -hmm. it was just interesting to see virtually the exact same words being used by Cap much later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So your research, uh, Marquez, it seeks to gain a greater understanding of the ways in which black male athletes, their academic, their athletic racial identities are all impacted by their lived experiences. Have you seen some Muhammad Ali's in your research? I want to know if I say necessarily Muhammad Ali's, you know, I was very much so influenced in this, what I call me search by Myron Roll. Someone who was willing to center his professional endeavors um, and say football is a part of me, but it's not all of me. That he also had the resources and support from his institution to fly him out to go and interview for this Rhodes Scholarship and understand that this means more than football. And so to me, individuals like that who really just had this goal, this passion, and 
uh, scholars such as one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Billy Hawkins and Dr. Joy Cooper, who are becoming these next generations of uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, you know, the godfather of sports sociology. They're helping us better understand and how we need to look at individuals holistically. Uh, and even through my life growing up, what it means to be a black male who's intelligent, who's not a dumb job, um, who can speak articulate, so to say, and even so not having kinky hair like everybody else, you know, I've existed as an enigma um, for what people assume what it means to be black male, athletic, and intelligent. I think as we are inspiring the youth and as we are empowering them to live full holistic lives, we need to allow them to be what they want to be. If a professional athlete is that support them, but also help them understand that that talent that they've been born with or nurtured over time is just only a part of themselves. What are they thinking about long-term to help them be successful and make them happy? Mm -hmm. So with Muhammad Ali, he was known for um, his bravado, a lot of, you know, trash talking. And I'm wondering where does that come from? And is there perhaps more to it than just entertainment? Is there, is there more to it in terms of self-esteem, in terms of being a Black man? Well, I certainly think that words and speech have always been very powerful in Black culture. The better you can talk, the more you can dominate. Um, you can play the dozens on people and decimate them without even touching them. So I think there's a degree of that and the kind of signifying that Ali does as he's creating his poems and not just critiquing his opponents, but also lashing out at the federal government, at white supremacy, all of that. So I think, I don't think you can separate his braggadocia as an athlete from mm -hmm. the power of his political voice and how he uses that as well. Mm -hmm. And this is, as Marquez points out, before an era where we have real technology that will spread his words in seconds and in real time. Yeah. yeah. And also this performative nature that we see from athletes has, has kind of always been there, the showboating, it, it draws us in. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what's also what Dr. Bab has mentioned as well is the fact that his words had context. It wasn't just to um, taunt his opponents. He was critiquing society. He was yes. critiquing his opponents' abilities. He was critiquing um, the reporters, the journalists, everyone. Mm -hmm. And just like as Kaepernick learned from him, he did his homework. You know, he was seeking through most of his life to find a sense of belonging with a faith-based faith system. Uh, you know, when he recognized the, the, um, the origin of his name and what that meant and its association with white supremacy and how he didn't want to be shackled by that. We even see a lot of times in which our um, Asian brothers and sisters at times when they may come to US or they have their names and how they adopt American names, so to say, partially because in our English language or at times we can't fully pronounce it but it makes it easier. And so that's not always the best thing is what are the ways in which we can then better understand each other without subscribing to whiteness to be quite frankly. I also feel like the way uh, Muhammad Ali did that made it more um, uh, digestible for some people. They were able to come to the table, you know, as opposed to being, to, to pushing away from that. And I'm wondering, it reminds me of how Black storytellers would mm. use the story to appeal to three or four different audiences at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you knew stuff, you could get it here. If you knew a little less, you got it here. And if you didn't know anything at all, you at least like hearing how the story was told. And I think that's exactly what is uh, going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we know that Muhammad Ali conscientiously objected to the Vietnam War. He refused the draft. And I'm wondering in what ways does his decision, you think, still resonate today? What can his actions teach us about this notion of patriotism and identity, which is, as you know, something that we're dealing with in, in 2021? Valerie. I think one of the things it teaches us is that patriotism does not mean hatred and violence against those who are not like you. Muhammad Ali, as much as he criticized American culture, was still very much American. As he said in several clips, I am not leaving my birth country. 
And he never lost sight of that. He liked the idea of what America could be, but he didn't like what America actually is. So I think one of the things he teaches us is to stop having this kind of false patriotism where you're really just using the American flag to express your own interest, your own hatred, your own fears, your own worries, all of that, because that is not patriotism. Patriotism is being able to stand for a cause the way Ali did and be willing to face the sanctions of taking that stance as well. There's a certain courageousness in that act that is not self-serving the way so much of our false patriotism today is very, very self-serving. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and that question also reminds me about a quote from good old uncle Jimmy James Baldwin in the sense that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. Yeah. And I think this is clearly evident in the sense that, you know, this American dream, this whole patriotism notion in the sense that, you know, if, as in Muhammad has talked about it before, that if, if he was Christian, what would, it, what would it look like and how he's navigating, how would the country see him? And he talked about it, going over and fighting that war is not a sense of being a patriot. Mm -hmm. And then even when he talked about him being in Canada, it's like, I'm an American. I was born in the U.S. That is my nation. They're not going to kick me out. I'm going back home. And so he had a lot of pride. I think that's the thing a lot of people at that time didn't understand is that he loved the country. He actually understood what it meant to be a quote unquote American, even though he knew he was black and as a black American. But at the same time, as we think about it today, what does it truly mean to be a, a, a person that was born into a country and critique it? And again, James Baldwin talks about that um in his uh talk to teachers and so i highly suggest those read that because it's much of the information that he articulates within that piece is still relevant today yeah and i find it interesting to look at that in terms of the olympic contest as well because he is representing america as an olympian but not getting any of the benefits of that and he talks about what it felt like to come back to louisville in his autobiography and interviews and realize that he was just another black person, not an American. Yep, Jackie Robinson. Yes. <laughs> they, right, the, list, <laughs> the list is long. Yes. Yeah. So Muhammad Ali, he went from being seen as very divisive, a divisive figure to this popular American icon. What attributed to this change in public opinion, do you think? <laughs> <Hmm>. <laughs> Um, I think someone in the documentary did allude to the fact that he became an icon as he became more and more frail as well. You heard that. And I think it would have been difficult for American culture to fully embrace him as an icon if he were still the Muhammad Ali we see even into the mid 70s, if he was still that outspoken, still that energetic, still had the power of his body, I'm not sure the reception would have been quite the same. Yeah, we heard in the documentary, he can't hurt us anymore. He can't hurt us anymore, yeah. Yes. I thought that was, yes. that, was um, that made me uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Because I think that is the case for, um, for how so much of white America views, particularly black men. Uh, Marquez, what do you think? Definitely, I mean, you see all the work that LeBron James is doing in the sense of he's using his platform to better and he was getting so much critique for only doing it in Cleveland. You know, people are saying, well, why aren't you doing it somewhere else? And he's like, this is home. You know, he left Miami to go there. He's built this school. And so I, I see that if, in some sense, people are learning from what Ali has done. You know, they may not directly say it, but what he has done, and, and not just him, you look at uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith at the time, Wilma Rudolph um, and, and Peter Norman, like all those individuals, both black and non at the time, they're individuals who are standing up for something, who saw what humanity could be. And I think that's the thing that Muhammad talks about, uh, or at least a looser time, it's like, this is not humanity. And what we expect, we should be expecting of each other and ourselves and so for and others. And if we're trying to get to a place that we are, um, there needs to be change. And I mean, to hold each other accountable. 
I was very surprised. I'm researching a book on LeBron James. And if I were not looking at timestamps and dates, I would swear I would be reading about Muhammad Ali in the 1960s, or even Jackie Robinson in the 50s, or Jack Johnson way back in the mm. The black male athlete is like a lightning rod for so many racial attitudes and values in the United States. And I think that's why black boxers have this kind of strange position in American culture where they're seen as nothing far above an animal, but yet still very powerful at the same time. And as Ali said in um, another piece that he wrote, if you take a black boxer and a white boxer and put them together, that's just like the <laughs> symbolism of American fear. Mm -hmm. And it just yes. generates all of that. And I think the figure of the black athlete has served that purpose in some ways. White America can feel in some ways that they're controlling this figure because they're paying for him. He is entertaining them. But that black masculinity has to be confined to an athletic field or to an arena. And the minute it steps outside of that into a more political and social sphere, then it becomes a threat all over again. Mm. Yeah. Very much, so, especially in this notion of how we even look at the ways in which the media talks about uh, black athletes at times by their athleticness, their proudness. But when we look at sort of white athletes, and the positions that they play are in, particularly in like football, you know, much more critical positions that when there's a black athlete, a black quarterback, you know, that becomes this big deal that, oh my gosh, here's this successful black quarterback and he's getting these passes on the trust. But it's like, why are we still talking about their athletic ability and not their critical thinking? Because even for an offensive lineman, they still have to think quickly. And a lot of times a lot quicker than these quarterbacks Absolutely. because they have to use their talent, use their strength, but also their brain to know how long, how much, which direction and so forth. And so, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. So there are some black icons whose names are uh, misused, I think, by a lot of politicians and others that are pushing forth their own agendas uh, that are quite frankly antithetical to the people that they're referring to, like John Lewis, Reverend Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, and I would even say Ali. So what do we do with that? Because certainly uh, these people should be celebrated, but um, you know, what do we do with that? How do we uh, preserve their legacies? Or, or is it even our job to do, I mean, you know, our job to I, do. When I first watched the documentary, I remember asking myself, what does it mean that we have taken Muhammad Ali and put him in the documentary jar? Mm -hmm. Do we mm -hmm. seal the lid and just kind of encase him in this glass vessel and put him on a shelf? or what? And I think that that can be the danger of this kind of deification to a certain degree. So I'm just hoping that, I'm very glad that information about Ali is getting out, about the other sides of him. I'm really glad that the recognition of his fight for social justice is there, but I hope that we take that fight and see it as a living thing that we are now responsible, that for that we have to make sure comes into fruition. Definitely. And for me too, is, is looking at them as whole individuals that are also flawed and vulnerable. Um, oftentimes we, there's been Jordan who's glorified, but Jordan ain't always been for the people. Um, <laughs> and he's, he's made a shift. We'll say he's made a shift. Um, you know, capitalism is real, but I, I think that's the thing is that we have to remember they're human. Um, they're, you know, Dr. King was not perfect. And, you know, Malcolm X, Malcolm was not perfect. So many of these figures that we deify and look at these living legends or legends as a whole and our heroes, they were still human. So they had to go through their journeys, but, you know, celebrate and honor the things they have accomplished, but don't make it seem like that that's all that they were. Um, I think that's very much so important as well. Mm. You remind me of Kobe Bryant. I'm thinking about that. And I mean, mm. that was passionate. 
um, I think on so many different fronts about deifying him and celebrating him, but he was very flawed. And very complicated. Yes. Person. Very complicated. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah, Oof. another male <laughs> athlete, <laughs> black <laughs> male athlete. Yeah, yeah. So let me see, we have a question from the audience. Can you speak about how Ali seemed to perpetuate racial stereotypes or concepts of beauty or ugliness? Hmm. I think that's a great follow-up question to Marquez's point that he was a human being and he was flawed and he, knew what he was capable of knowing given how he grew up and the way in which he believed that he knew everything, I think kind of shut down his being able to learn anything else. So yeah, absolutely. His performance on the surface can look like a very stereotypical performance. You know, the brashness, the braggadocia, the way he's constantly um, talking about how beautiful he is opening his mouth very, very wide to get his point out. All of that I think feeds the stereotypes, but I think that is also just the surface performance. And there are mm. layers underneath that. Other viewers looking at that will be happy to see a black man mouthing off to white reporters and to the white establishment. Mm. So I don't think that we could ever say too, too simply that he, reinforce stereotypes. I think it's more complicated than that. I think we wanted him and we needed to project our stereotypes onto him in a sense. And I also uh, completely agree. And I also feel as though it's like, he knew that if no one else was gonna say something, someone had to, and he was okay with it being himself. Um, he was going to shake the table. Um, he was going to say things, but he also, I think because of that knew he had to uh, back it up and put some uh, meat behind it. And so as I've uh, kind of um, simmered on this question, you know, he was a victim of John Henryism. We watched him really put himself out Henry there himself and yes. yes, all the way down. And he knew he had to always perform and he, he knew he, always, he had to win. He done said what he had said, and so now you've got to you got to show up, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, his body said we can't take it no more, and that's the unfortunate thing that we see from so many um, um, black youth in terms of glorifying black athletes is that they only see what they see on TV, they don't know who they are, how much work they put in, and at times sacrifice, or even what it's like to be, especially football players. You know, you're you're giving a you're giving a check at the end of the game. It's not like basketball where it's guaranteed. And so you've got to perform on that day. And if you don't, you're not necessarily getting paid what you may have thought. And that could mean a lot for your future because you may have three, four, seven years at the most. And then what? Your body is beaten up. You know, CTE is real. Your, your memory, your brain, your cognitive ability. And so we've got to protect our youth. We have to let them see that they can pursue this, but what else are you going to pursue? What else can be, what else are you going to invest so much of your life long-term in? Because at some point the body cannot keep up at that level. Yeah. And I wish that the documentary had just extended those scenes where we see the quieter Ali. He's a little bit older, he's a little bit wiser, mm. and he's not talking as much. And you know, it's because he, had, he has learned some things somewhat painfully, but he has learned some things. So I think that goes to your point that young people only see these guys for the most part in this glory phase and don't mm -hmm. see the subtleties, don't see the nuances that they have to go through afterwards. Yeah, we see a, a couple of moments in there, uh, Muhammad Ali as the family man. And I'm wondering what you uh, thought about that, um, especially a man that had uh, lots of daughters, <laughs> girls. Yeah. yeah. What, did you, what did you think of that? It was good to see, but at the same time, it goes back to that thing where we both met. It, he was complicated. Um, I think there are sides to him and his family and um, especially which ones of his children were speaking up at times or, or giving insights. 
Um, that is actually very telling. Um, silence tells you more. Um, a lot of in, in many moments, and so yeah, it it would really be interesting to really have a true, not only true, but a more um, broader understanding of what he was like outside of. Because we've seen it, we've seen his daughter's book um, and other information, but his his um, I want to say there's a relationships, but his entanglements and engagements with the opposite sex would, uh, for those who may not know, I think would surprise a lot um, who aren't as privy to that information. Mm -hmm. the, I think um, the keeper of his flame has left a lot of that information out. Interestingly enough, I think it also shows the gender divide of professional mm. athletes. We are seeing something like, oh, he's such a good father for his daughters. He's supposed to be a good father <laughs> for his daughters. And then women athletes who are trying to juggle being a mother while being a professional athlete get no support, no attention, no reward. <laughs> I'm so right. <ready>. Yes. <laughs> Allison Felix, prime example, yes, or at least in most of public eye. And it's amazing. And if, if anything, you know, she may be a modern um, version of, of a woman in the sense of what Muhammad Ali has done, civil rights and sports mm -hmm. for a woman. And what she has done and really opened up space, understanding that you are limiting who I am and you're trying to hold my gender against me, my biological sex, because I'm a woman and I want to have children and take away everything from me to perform. And so I'm, I'm going to capitalize upon that in the nature of I'm going to create space for other women to be full to support them um and so many other uh, women especially black women and so it, it's amazing to see how they are um transforming what we know about what it means to be a black athlete particularly black woman athlete in sports today mm. yeah yeah uh, one of Muhammad Ali's daughters uh, boxed for a while. Layla, yes. Layla Ali, she was like, yes, boxer. Yeah, before she retired, and like his grandson is the next one to take up the mantle. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I just learned that recently as well. <laughs> okay, that's his grandson. Yeah, he just had a fight. I think a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little longer um, time concept is difficult for me during this period but <laughs> yeah <laughs> well talk about pressure you know for him to box oh my yes. goodness yes i don't envy him not at all at all, <laughs> at all. <laughs> well this has been quite an interesting conversation and i thank you both so much uh, for for having it with us and I'd like to thank everyone uh, who have joined us on this Zoom uh, for this virtual event. Uh, thank you to the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History and the Auburn Avenue Research Library for your partnership. Muhammad Ali is available to stream online at pbs.org slash Ali. That's where you can see all of it. And then for information about all of our community programs and events, because we certainly do others, please visit us at gpb.org slash community. Once again, thank you both so much uh, for your time, Valerie and Marquez. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Yes, thank you. Gotta say it too, and go dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all and good night. Good night, thank you. Good night, thank you.